Talk to me about time restricted feeding, because for a long time, that was like the hot new girl in school and everyone loved it and it was really interesting. But it seems like the trend is swaying at least a little bit away from time restricted feeding, especially on a morning. So what's your how do you conceptualize all of this now? Um, so time restricted feeding or time restricted eating you know, it, the, it it's a form of intermittent fasting, right? And I think that many people, when they think about intermittent fasting, they think, okay, well, I just need to skip a meal. I need to like have a period of, I need to extend my period of time where I'm not eating. And the easiest way to do that is skip, skip a meal. Um, and that's kind of what happened. So, you know, Dr. Sachin Panda, a good friend of mine, big, you know, circadian biologist researcher, does a lot of research on time-restricted feeding. And, um, you know, we talked about this like almost 10 years ago. Essentially, there's a circadian reason to eat your food within a certain time window and then have a period of rest and fasting, right? So everything on our body runs on a clock and including our metabolism. And, um, you know, so, so we're most insulin sensitive in the morning, least sensitive, uh, uh, insulin sensitive in the evening, right? So, you know, your blood glucose levels will go much higher with the same carbohydrate intake in the evening versus the morning, even, you know, just calories are the same, everything's the same. There's also some argument to be made by you just need a period of rest, like your gut digestion, all that like energy is being diverted to do that when you're digesting food like that's that's a big thing and there's also a lot of responses that happen after you eat a meal causing inflammation and things like that that divert energy there so it's taking energy away from other things like repair so so repairing processes usually happen when you're in a fasted state so just like when you're sleeping your brain shuts down right like your brain if you didn't sleep your brain's not going to repair it's not going to stop like you need that rest period well, the same goes for like other organs, like it need, they need a rest period. And and so it's really important to have that rest period, right? So the longer the rest, it, the longer the rest period is, the better in terms of like having enough energy to like do those repair processes, things like that require energy. And there's also, you know, other reasons as well. But generally speaking, um, there's an argument why it's good to have a rest period, a fasting period, right? And is that, does it need to be 16 hours? Does it need to be 20? Does it need to be 12? Like, I don't I don't really know that we know the exact time um, to that. But what we do know is that talking about this to the public was translated to, I need to skip breakfast. That was like the take home was, okay, I need to do a 16 hour, I need to do eat my food within eight hours and do a 16 hour fast. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to skip breakfast and yeah. keep extend my fast. Lunch period. at 12, have dinner right. at eight, graze between then and and that was hands off. exactly. And that was that was kind of the the take home, the practical implication there that everyone started doing. Um, the problem with that is that, you know, so our muscle is the biggest reservoir for amino acids. Just like, you know, we store glucose as glycogen in our liver and our muscle. We store um, triglyceride as, you know, you know, we fat as triglycerides in our adipose tissue. We don't really store muscle. I mean, we don't really store amino acids, but you can kind of think of the muscle as a reservoir for it because when we have a period of um, basically we're not getting an intake of amino acids, we need it. We need amino acids to survive. Like we need them. And so our body pulls from our muscle. So in the morning, if you think about it, what's the longest period you go without having amino acids? Well, it's when you're sleeping. So breakfast is actually really important. It's, in, it's important to get protein, amino acids in that first meal because if you extend that me if you extend that fasting period by skipping breakfast, your body is going to be like, I need protein. I need I got to make a bunch of proteins to like have my heart beat and my kidneys function, right? So it's going to pull amino acids out of your muscle, and so um, that can cause muscle atrophy, particularly if you're not doing resistance training. So amino acid is one way to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Um, the other way to do it would be resistance training. So there have been studies done, like, for example, women that are doing time-restricted feeding, they will not lose muscle mass if they're doing resistance training. Mm. So does it mitigate the gains of resistance training by doing that? It mitigates the, the atrophy. So it, it's mitigating- No, the sorry. Does time-restricted feeding, i.e. skipping breakfast, limit the gains made from resistance training if- 
both of those things are done together? N- not not if you're getting enough protein. I mean, it, it, not in that study, at least. Understood. I think I think if you're not getting enough protein within 24 hour period, yes. But like if you're getting so so the, to get your gains in, and I'm sure you've had people on talking about this, but like the RDA for protein is. 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. And that was like determined like forever ago when we were using older techniques, we as in scientists, not me, because I haven't personally done this experiment, but um, the scientific community was using techniques that uh, underestimated amino acid losses. So so these committees were set up to determine, okay, how many, how much amino acids, do, you know, how, what quantity of amino acids do we lose every day? And how much do we make sure we have to get each day to replenish that, right? Um, and so those losses were underestimated. In other words, we're losing more than they thought. And so what what does that mean? That means, oh, maybe when the RDA for protein is too low. So people like Dr. Stuart Phillips and others have now redone these experiments with like newer, more sensitive technologies, because that's what happens with time, right? We get better technologies, more sensitivity. And they've now determined that it's actually 1.2 grams per kilogram to just bare minimum prevent losses. It's and another if you're doing 50% on top of what was originally. 50% on what originally. And if you're actually doing, phys- if you're physically active, if you're doing resistance training, that goes up to 1.6 wow. grams per kilogram. That's the minimum. And well, 1.2 was the minimum, but like yeah. to like build muscle yep. to get the gains you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And there's actually been studies done in older adults. This is a big problem. Older adults are, they're not as sensitive to amino acids. It's called anabolic resistance. So with the same protein intake, they won't build as much muscle if they're 65 versus when they were 30. So granddad needs to be cooking twice as many steaks. He needs basically. twice as many steaks. And there have been studies looking at the actual RDA of older adults get 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. And then the other group gets 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight. The group that got 1.2 has much higher muscle mass gains. Yep. And and just pre- actually prevents the atrophy that is, ha- is happening just with age. Okay. So getting back to the time-restricted yes. eating thing. Yes. <clears throat> How should someone incorporate this into their lifestyle? What it sounds like you're saying is have a high protein meal at some point early in the day. Uh, But if you're also saying that it's important for us to have a period of rest and digest so that it's digest, rest and repair can actually happen. How should people think about, about doing that? Especially given the fact that, sorry, later in the day, insulin sensitivity is... Uh, skewed anyone that did carb night or carb backloading 15 years ago because they read a bodybuilding.com forum like me knows that so you've kind of got this oh it's good to eat some things later in the day there's this skew down that way but there's also we can't miss breakfast so it's like that just sounds like eating all day to me when do we when do we stop right um yeah sorry i went off on a tangent there but yeah so um the 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 time restricted eating okay there's a there's a couple good ways to think about about it you want to stop eating about three hours before you go to bed if possible, okay. That's last bit of food in mouth. Yes, yes, because it's still you got to add another five. So last bit of, bit of food in mouth doesn't mean I'm now in a fasted state. You got to calculate five hours after that. It takes about five hours to digest. Okay, so after the five hours after your last bit of food in mouth, now you're in a fasted state, right? So that's going to be when you're sleeping, most likely. Um, you don't have to skip a meal. You can eat your food within an eight hour period. And fast for 16 hours without having to skip a meal most of the time. Unless, I guess, unless you're an entertainer and your meals do come later, then, but still, you can still, like, everything's just shifted over. And yes, you'll be, you know, less insulin insulin sensitive later in the day, but you can, like, do some air squats for two minutes. Like, you could, there there, there are things you can do to improve insulin sensitivity and also to improve glucose blood glucose levels like later in the evening if you're having a meal and we can talk more about that later. But anyway, so there are things you can do. I think that the way to think about it is the easy way is to to stop eating about three hours before bed. That's a really easy and also your sleep improves because you're when you're digesting, if you eat like right before you go to bed, your body's like awake. It's like awake, right? It's like digesting and using energy. It's it's well, not even beyond what's happening physiologically, just the sense of being full. So I was a club promoter for 15 years, which meant that we would work from, uh, we'd set the club up at 9 p.m. and we'd finish at two in the morning and I'd get back and the food that I'd prepped that morning, the day before's morning, would be there waiting for me. Oh, well, you know, I haven't eaten in six hours, seven hours, something like that. Okay, so I'll get in and I'll eat. But just the discomfort of having a lot of food in you 
like even that sucks, right? right? Uh, and you know, the other thing is with with uh, thinking about it, I think um, a lot of you know, people got all like, you know, in a tizzy over over the fact that like if you looked at the the time restricted feeding. And the weight loss, a lot of the weight loss was due to caloric restriction because people were just actually eating less. They were skipping meals. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. So a lot of weight loss, I mean, when it comes to weight loss, like calories in, calories out matter, like energy balance, right? So that's important. I think that's where a lot of people were like, oh, time restricted eating doesn't matter because it's all about caloric restriction. And it's like, well, yeah, if you're looking at what endpoint are you looking at? Are you trying to lose weight? Then you, caloric restriction, like you should be not eating get there much. however you want right and most people that are like obese even overweight they can actually they can actually fast and not lose as much muscle like some people will go on a fast or do you know limit their they'll skip meals basically and they can lose like up to 30 percent of their weight will come from muscle so that's you know, crazy it's crazy unless you do resistance training or resistance training which important. will mitigate that which will but mitigate presumably that. only if you're having sufficient protein outside of that intermittent fasting window? Not necessarily. Um, that will help you gain more, but like mitigating the atrophy because- You got the stimulus. You got the stimulus. Okay. What would you suggest as a good selection of breakfasts that people could have that kind of meet the criteria that you're talking about here? What I would mean, be some eggs, of the things? Right. Eggs would be like like four, depending on your body weight. You know, some if you're, if you're a dude, you're probably going to have more like five- eggs scrambled eggs are great you've got i mean it's got the protein and eggs are really high and they have like lutein and choline in them i mean choline's important for brain function um lutein it's much higher in greens like kale but there's some in at least pasture raised eggs from the the farm you know the non-conventional eggs or whatever they're called those are terrible um but what is that to, just to interject that what is that to know about eggs how do you select your eggs pasture raised um because you want them to eat like grass and stuff the chickens because they're get they're getting like lutein from the greens and lutein is really important for brain function and eye function i would love to talk about that more when we talk about cognitive function because it actually there's like a lot there's not enough lutein in an egg to substitute what's done in clinical studies but there is in kale so uh, but still it's good to get a source of it so i think i think eggs is a really good source of um protein for breakfast mm -hmm. because it's you know it's just it's very nutrient dense with the choline as well choline's really high in egg yolk bacon and eggs steak and eggs yeah i mean like whatever your your jam is like for the for the protein bacon and eggs steak and eggs you know um i like to also have some smoked salmon and eggs 